Well, first of all, I just want to say it's a real pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, every time I come to an event like this, I'm always both so inspired and encouraged about all the great things that are happening. And every time I come to such an event, it's inevitable you meet some incredible people. So thank you. It's great to be here. One quick story. Uh, so I grew up in Colorado. And I realized I hadn't been back to Nebraska since I was a student at the University of Colorado. So as I was flying in yesterday, I kept thinking, well, what is the first thought that comes to me when I think about Nebraska? And it was, your football team used to beat the crap out of the University of Colorado with great regularity. Honestly, it was the first thought. So here's what I'd like to do in the next hour. So four years ago, I wrote this book called Anatomy of an Epidemic. And anatomy was really meant to raise a question, a very fundamental question. And that is, how is this paradigm of care that we really embrace, the drug-centered paradigm of care, how is it really working for us broadly as a society? Is it reducing the burden of mental illness in our society or not? And as part of that question, there is the possibility, do we need to rethink this paradigm of care? And, and that's and really the thought was to see what science and history tell us about answering that question. And before I go into that, I just want to say a couple caveats. One is, this book was never meant to be in any way a medical advice book, to what an individual should take from it. It really was to be this big picture of how we as a society think about developing a paradigm of care. And so no one should take what I'm about to say as any meant to be uh, advice for any individual. And I'm sure there's many people on medications, and I write this in the book today, who are doing great on the medications, find them extremely helpful, and that is fantastic. And so just don't take what we talk about here as in any way uh, uh, challenging that reality. So our societal understanding about this, our current drug-centered paradigm of care is of course it's working. And the story around uh, that understanding goes like this. <clears throat> in 1955, a drug called corpomazine, or Thorazine, arrives in asylum medicine. And this kicks off a great advance in care, a great psychopharmacological revolution. And we remember this drug today as the first antipsychotic. Can you hear this word, antipsychotic? As if it's an antidote to psychosis, a specific sort of cure or treatment for whatever is causing psychotic symptoms. And then of course we get antidepressants, anti-anxiety agents. Again, you can hear in those words the sense that the drugs are antidotes to some sort of specific pathology. As part of the story going forward, we hear it's, it's the antipsychotics that made it possible for us to deinstitutionalize. It made it possible for people who previously had to be in state and county mental hospitals to live independently in the community. And then going forward with the story of progress, in 1987, Prozac arrives on the market. This is the first of the second generation psychiatric drugs, which are said to be safer and more effective than the first. Then we get the atypical antipsychotics, which again are said to be so much better than the older standard antipsychotics. So this is the story of progress. And in 1998, U.S. Surgeon General David Satcher uh, wrote a, a long report on mental health, and he basically summarized the story of progress. He said this, Prior to the arrival of Thorazine in asylum medicine, we lacked treatments that would prevent people from becoming chronically ill. And now we have this vast array of safe and effective treatments that enable people to live fairly normal lives and, 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 and prevent chronicity, in essence, was the message. So that's the story of progress. And the other element of this story of progress is this, that we've all heard is that the psychiatric drugs fix chemical imbalances in the brain, like insulin for diabetes. And that's a metaphor that also tells of great progress. So think about like insulin for diabetes. With diabetes, you know you have an insulin de deficiency. You're now correcting that deficiency. And in medicine, that is a model for great progress, when you understand the pathology and then you have something that fixes it. So if that part of the story is true, then almost certainly we have made great progress in treating mental disorders. And that's the, the general understanding out there in society about this 
our drug-centered paradigm of care, and why the medications are so absolutely essential to treatment, especially of severe mental disorders. But what I did in anatomy as a first step in putting that story of progress under a microscope is just look at the number of people in our society who, in essence, are under government care because of a mental illness. So in 1955, the, quote, disabled mentally ill, those who couldn't take care of themselves, were in state and county mental hospitals. And at that time, there were about, this is 1955, this is the year that uh, Thorazine arrives in asylum medicine. And at that year, there were 550,000 people in the United States in state and county mental hospitals. But you need to look at that data a bit closer, because at that time, the state and county mental hospitals were also serving in part as nursing homes. So you had people in those, in those mental hospitals with end-stage dementia, related to syphilis, Alzheimer's, et cetera. And so there were actually 350,000 people with a psychiatric diagnosis in the mental hospitals at that time. So you take that number, you look at the population at that time, and that gives you a disability rate due to mental illness, and it was about one in, four, one in 500, basically, at that time. Now, we deinstitutionalize over the next 25 years, and what other researchers have said, if you want to, to track the number of disabled mentally ill in our society, and I don't, I, I'm just using their language, okay? I'm not, it's just, just their language for measuring, one measurement of the, quote, burden of mental illness in our society. You now need to look at the number of people on SSI or SSDI, the two programs that will provide support, and look at the number of people declared eligible for those programs because of a, a psychiatric disorder. And you find that by 1987, this is the year Prozac arrives, and deinstitutionalization is pretty complete at that time, there were 1.25 million adults, 18 to 66, on disability due to mental illness. So during this era of the first generation psychiatric drugs, we went from 350,000 people to 1.25 million people on, quote, disabled by mental illness. And that's a disability rate of roughly one in 184. So it's increased during that first generation. Now the obvious caveat here is this. Maybe that's an unfair comparison. Maybe you had to be much sicker, so to speak, to be in the hospital in 1955 than to be on disability in 1987. So going forward, now let's look at the disability numbers since 1987 going forward because that's the same metric. It's also since 1987 that we as a society really embrace the use of psychiatric medications. So for example, in 1987, we spent as a society about $800 million on psychiatric drugs. In 2010, we spent around $40 billion, a 50-fold increase. And as you know, about one in five Americans now takes a psychiatric drug on a daily basis, something like that, the, the latest uh, data. So what happened to the disability numbers from 1987 to 2010? They went from 1.25 million to now around 5 million people. So that's a, a fourfold increase, and we're now at a disability rate of about 1 in 70, 1 in 75. So you can see the, the, the question here. Why, as we get more people get treated, and why as we use these medications more, why are we seeing the burden of mental illness in our society going up, at least as measured by those disability numbers? Now, when this book came out, um, people said, ah, oh, it's just in the United States you're seeing this rise in disability. And one of the reasons you're seeing such a rise in disability in the United States is you don't provide national health service. You know, you've had welfare reform that basically practically eliminated welfare. It's a social problem. Well, since that time, I've been doing a lot of speaking abroad and there's been translations. And you see this same rise in disability in every society that has made uh, great use of the medications. So for example, Australia, fourfold increase in the last 20 years. New Zealand, fourfold increase in the last 20 years. Denmark, the number of people going on disabilities has tripled in the last uh, 15 years. So you see this problem showing up over and over again. Now, I don't think the disability data proves anything about the merits of medications. But I do think it raises a question. Why are we seeing such a rise in disability? And because obviously I think the goal here, the hope here, 
both on an indiv individual level and on a societal level, is in fact to have a system of care that when someone has a difficulty, a psychotic episode, a severe bout of depression, a manic episode, as much as possible, it helps nurture that person to get back a full-fledged life, go back to work, go back and, 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 and have a normal life as much as possible, both on a societal level and an individual level. So what I did in this book, because I think this raises a question, is then ask this question. What does science and history tell us about the long-term effects of psychiatric medications? And the reason this book has gotten uh, some attention, both controversial and, <laughs> you know, is, is because I think it's really the first book to try to answer that question about long-term effects. Because how do drugs get approved? Well, they, they, they knock down a target symptom of disorder better than placebo over the short term. So we know they work sort of short-term symptom control. But what I wanted to ask in this book is this. How do they affect people in terms of larger scope of their lives over the course of f 2, 5, 10, 15, 20 years? And in other functions than just symptom control? How about employment, social you know, engagement, that sort of thing? These functional outcomes as well. So it's a different question I was trying to raise here. So what I thought I would do now, and, and in the book I, I look at this for psychotic disorders, antipsychotics, how do they shape the long-term course of schizophrenia and psychotic disorders. I look at it for depression, for anxiety, and then I also look at where are all the bipolar patients coming from, because if you really want to get into the disability numbers, you have to figure out why there's been such a rise in the number of people so diagnosed. And what, what we'll focus on now in the next few minutes is looking at what literature has to tell us about the long-term effects of antipsychotics on the course of schizophrenia and psychotic disorders. Now, the first thing that's important for me to do as a journalist is to understand what is called the evidence base for the use of these drugs. If you're in medicine today, uh, this is a common phrase. We have to have an evidence base guiding our use of treatments. And one of the thoughts around that idea of evidence base is, it, is that it's possible for doctors to become deluded about the merits of their therapies, and you want some objective level saying, yes, these treatments are beneficial. And if you look at the evidence base for antipsychotics, it has three parts. One goes back to the 60s, 1960s. You take people coming into an emergency room with psychotic symptoms, you run trials where half are put on drug, the other half were put on placebo, and with pretty great regularity, after six weeks, the drug-treated patients are doing better. They have a greater diminishment of psychotic symptoms, and so we say the drugs are effective in treating acute episodes of psychosis. Now imagine you're a doctor in the 1960s. What's your next question? You're a psychiatrist. Your next question is, how long should I keep people on these medications? And so they ran studies designed like this. They took those who had stabilized well on antipsychotics, generally for six months to a year, they took that group of good responders, and they ran studies in which half the people were abruptly withdrawn from the drug, the other were maintained on the drug, and with great regularity, those abruptly withdrawn relapsed at a higher rate. In other words, they had a return of psychotic symptoms. So the doctors naturally concluded, see, you take a drug away and the disease returns, so staying on the drug lowers the risk of relapse, okay? And that became the data, the evidence base for long-term use. Now I think there's, and if you, you can even see this is still cited. What is our evidence base for long-term use of antipsychotics? It's the relapse studies. Those studies where we withdraw the medication from one of the two arms. Now I think there's actually a third really powerful part of the evidence base, even though it's not officially part of it. And it's clinical experience of doctors. So imagine you're a psychiatrist. People come into your emergency room. You give them a medication. It works, right? Often diminishes symptoms. People go home. Some people say, I don't like these drugs. They throw them away. They relapse, come back to your emergency room. So your clinical experience tells you these medications are effective both over the short term and the long term. Next step as a journalist, and follow me here. Do the relapse studies, is there, are there any flaws with the evidence base related to the relapse studies, that information we use for long-term use? Yeah. 
And you can see there's a couple flaws. One is the design of the studies. Because almost all of them are abrupt withdrawal, and we actually know now that what happens is you're dropped the in, in response to the brain, in response to the drug, your brain under, undergoes some compensatory adaptations. Now you take away the drug and that actually increases the risk of relapse, especially abruptly. And there's very few gradual withdrawal studies in the relapse literature. So we know that abrupt withdrawal design, in fact, is inflating the risk of relapse when you come off the medication. So that's one, one flaw. The second flaw is this. Do the relapse studies tell you how people are functioning? They tell you, don't go off your drug abruptly. Really bad idea. But they don't tell us about employment, socialization, that sort of thing. So if you, so, and those two flaws are, are quite recognized. And then the third flaw is this in terms of that clinical part of the evidence base. Do doctors today have any experience with what we might call the natural uh, course of schizophrenia or the natural course of psychosis, unmedicated? In other words, what we see now is the medicated course of these disorders. And so imagine we ran a study like this. People come in, first episode psychosis. Half are put on intensive psychosocial care, no drug. And the other half, intensive psychosocial care plus antipsychotic. And now we follow them for two, five, ten years. Do we know what might happen to this unmedicated group? We don't, right? So that's the other flaw, is we really don't know what is what might be called the natural spectrum of outcomes with people undergoing a first episode of psychosis. That's what's missing for it. And one of the things we're going to look at here today is what is science telling us about some of the capacity to fully recover from psychotic episodes and even a diagnosis of schizophrenia. So my next step is, once I understand those flaws in the relapse literature, those limitations of it, is then to search through the research literature to see if researchers can say, OK, but there's other types of evidence that show that these medications are improving the long-term course of schizophrenia and psychotic disorders. And when you do that, you will find, time and time again, as people say, we don't have that evidence. So for example, Emmanuel Stipp, a well-known psychiatrist from the University of Montreal, in 2002, he did precisely that. And he said this, after 50 years of using antipsychotics, do we have evidence that these medications improve the long-term course of schizophrenia? And he said, in fact, there is no compelling evidence on the matter. And then he said something really profound. One thing is for sure, he said, we take a genuine risk in taking a closer look at what has long been considered fact as we may find some surprises. And in essence, that is the risk you all are taking over the next 45 minutes by inviting me here. <laughs> because maybe we'll find some things that challenge what we think we know to be true. Now the goal of this, of course, is can information lead to a better use of medications and a better form of care? That's obviously the goal. So now let's go and see what science does tell us, or is telling us, about the long-term effects of, of antipsychotic medications. So the first thing I did is I went back to see what sort of outcomes were we getting for first episode schizophrenia patients from 1945 to 1955. This is in the decade before antipsychotics arrived. And our common understanding is people didn't get better, right? They had to stay in the hospital. It was the drugs that made it possible for people to live outside the hospital. Well, in 1956, the NIMH convened a conference on this very question. They said, what sort of outcomes were we getting in the decade prior to the arrival of the antipsychotics? And they had done two five-year studies, and here's what they found. Of first episode patients diagnosed with schizophrenia, roughly 65 to 75 percent would be discharged within 12 to 18 months. This is prior to using the medications. And at five years, roughly two-thirds would be living in the community. In other words, they would not have gone back into the hospital. Employment rates were above 50% back then. We have forgotten that sort of recovery pattern. Now, in the United States, we were diagnosing schizophrenia pretty broadly, although it was a term being applied to psychotic patients coming into hospitals. 
In England, they were diagnosing uh, schizophrenia more narrowly. So it was a, quote, sicker population. And they did a five-year study during the same time. And what did they find? They found that five years later, this is before the arrival of antipsychotics, one-third of patients were no longer, quote, schizophrenic at the end of five years. They had had a schizophrenic time, but then those symptoms had disappeared, and they were working and that sort of thing. There was another 20% of patients out in the community who were still symptomatic. They might be hearing voices, whatever, might have some paranoid thoughts, but they were able to function okay. So again, in England, you'll see employment rates above 50%. Now, you, have you all heard the idea that uh, outcomes sometimes for schizophrenia fall around along this spectrum of one-third, one-third, one-third? Have you heard that, one-third? Well, sometimes you see this in the research literature, and I think it's coming in part from this time. And what it means is, if we go back to first episode, you'll have one-third of people who, in fact, will recover from schizophrenia and just not be uh, symptomatic. There'll be another third that will remain symptomatic but can function pretty well. And there's only going to be about one-third that really becomes chronically ill. So that's actually a much more optimistic picture than we often think about uh, people so diagnosed. So now let's go forward. The drugs come in, and now let's see what sort of research we can find about the effect of medications on long-term outcomes. The first such study is done in 1963, and it has four arms. People come into an emergency room. Three groups are randomized to an antipsychotic medication. The fourth is the placebo. At the end of six weeks, the drug-treated patients are doing better. But many of the placebo patients, in fact, have gotten better as well. Then they're discharged, and then they come back and see where the patients, how they're doing a year later. And at the end of the first year, and this is the very first longer-term study we have, the researchers, the NIMH researchers, noticed something odd. All three drug-exposed groups had higher rehospitalization rates at the end of one year. So at this very early moment of the research literature, you see the vaguest hint of a paradox. Could medications that are effective over the short term, could they possibly be increasing the chronicity over the long term? And by the way, one of the things I want to talk about, and I'm, we'll go forward here. When we talk about medications improving long-term outcomes, it means like, let me take a, a, a step back. You know the Hippocratic Oath. Make no, but do no harm. So what does that mean? We tend to think it means don't make your patient worse, right? It's not what it means. What Hippocrates was saying is there's often a natural capacity to recover in nature from an illness. And in order to do no harm, you have to improve on that natural capacity to recover. So imagine you have an illness like this. People come in, they have various symptoms. You give an intervention and 50% are cured and 50% stay the same. Have you done no harm? Hippocrates would say, you don't know. Because maybe there's a 70% natural cure rate. And so my point is when we're talking now as we're going through long-term outcomes, it's against that, that we're trying to see against that pattern of, in the absence of medication, what might we be seeing. Does that make sense? In other words, you can have many people getting better and still not be improving overall aggregate outcomes, okay? Anyway, going forward, the next step was a, a retrospective study done by Sanborn Bakoven at Boston Psychopathic Hospital. And he had five-year data for a group of first episode patients treated in 1947 with psychosocial care but no medications. And he had a, a five-year data for a similar group of patients treated in 1967 with psychosocial care and antipsychotics. And what did he find? He found two things. One, the relapse rate was higher in the modern cohort. There was more rehospitalization in the, in the 67 cohort. Much more important was the modern cohort was much more socially dependent. They were much less likely to be working. So if you go back to Sanborn Bachhoven, he says, I'm surprised by this, but if we're interested in long-term functional outcomes, maybe we need to rethink this about their long-term effects. So that was a retrospective study funded by the NIMH. And you all know the NIMH, National Institute of Mental Health. This is our body for doing research. 
So in the 1970s, the NIMH funded three studies of longer term length meant to revisit the question of the merits of antipsychotics over a longer period of time. One was done by Maurice Rappaport at the University of California, San Francisco. It was designed like this. People came into the hospital and it wasn't placebo. They were either put on drug or they were put on nothing. Then they're, they're treated in the hospital that way. There was basically something they call milieu therapy. They're discharged and then they're followed for three years. Okay? And in that follow-up period, people who were treated without drug in the hospital can go on and people who were treated with drug in the hospital can go off. Okay? It becomes a naturalistic. So what did he find? He found two found findings. The group treated on a whole, the group treated in the hospital without medications did better over three years, on the whole. But more important was this. Of the 41 patients randomized to no drug, 24 never went on drug, got through their psychotic episode, and it was that group that was never exposed that had by far the best outcome. In other words, they had a rehospitalization rate of about 8%. Whereas actually the, the group treated with medication and that stayed on medication, they had a three-year rehospitalization rate of about 73%. So much higher. So what does Rappaport say? Rappaport says this. It seems that this idea that all patients need to be treated with antipsychotics upon a first episode is mistaken. Maybe there is a subset of patients, if we give them care, who could get through their psychotic episode, not need to go on, and that group, that subset, could therefore have a good long-term outcome. So what you see in the Rappaport study is the beginning of an idea of selective use of medication, rather than one size fits all. Now there was a second such study done by Lauren Mosher. Lauren Mosher at this time was head of schizophrenia studies at the NIMH, so he's our top schizophrenia doctor. His study was designed like this. People come to an emergency room. They're either put in the hospital and treated conventionally with medications, or they're randomized to experimental form of care. And in experimental form of care, what happens is a small woman, and by the way, many of these people are being brought to the emergency room in, in handcuffs by the police, that sort of thing. A small woman named Alma Min, almost about this tall, uh, would drive up in a little VW, and the person would get in the VW, and she would take them to a house, a Victorian house staffed by people who, I think the job description was this, don't get freaked out when people are having psychotic symptoms. It was basically it. And then the idea was you would just be with people. Uh, one small note, this house was run by Voice Hendricks. Uh, this house, this, this, this experiment ran for about 10 years. Voice Hendricks is the cousin of Jimi Hendrix. And if you ever, there are some Soteria house models starting to spring up now in one. Vermont has funded one and all. And if you want to do a Soteria house, make sure you get someone like Voice Hendricks to run the house. Because Voice, if you ever have a chance to meet him, is an extraordinary human being. He's the sort of human being, when you're with him, you say to yourself, I'm pretty cool. I'm, he likes me. So he has this extraordinary warmth that just spreads. And I think the success of Soteria house was related very much to the staff they had there. What were the results? The results were really quite remarkable. It, oh, sorry, medication use in the Soteria arm. They would not immediately put people on antipsychotics. They did use benzodiazepines to restore sleep wake. They thought it was important to get people sleeping again. And then they waited. And if people weren't getting better after two or three weeks, then they used antipsychotics. So it was a delayed use model. Okay, so it's not a no use model. Anyway, going, going forward. At the end of six weeks, this is pretty remarkable, psychotic symptoms actually had abated as much in the Soteria group as in the hospitalized group. And then at the end of two years, the Soteria group was doing better on a measure, a number of functions, a number of measures, uh, lower psychopathology, lower rehospitalization, greater social functioning, etc. Medication usage was like this. At the end of two years, 20% were on antipsychotic medications. Roughly another 40% had used them temporarily. They found them helpful for a period of time. And 40% never needed to go on. So what did Lauren Mosher conclude? He said, at the basis of this, if we're interested in long-term clinical improvements, long-term function, we need to rethink the use of these medications along a more selective use model. So that was the second study. The third study was done by William Carpenter in-house. He's a still a well-known schizophrenia researcher. 
done at an in-house hospital. It was basically meant to see is psychotherapy helpful for people with psychotic symptoms. They found it was. And then they had another element. 27 patients were not treated with medication, 22 were. And what they find at the end of one year is there was a higher relapse rate among the 22 treated with medications. And they also suffered a bit more from depression, that sort of thing. So what did William Carpenter conclude? Two conclusions. This is in 1977. At the end of this, they asked the people who went through their psychotic episode without medication what it was like. And here's what the people said. It was really painful. It hurt. Some people said they wished they'd had their feelings numbed. But others said they were grateful that they didn't have their feelings numbed while they were going through it. And Carpenter at that time concluded maybe because of that, they end up with a greater resilience. So you'll see that show up in the NIMH research in 1977. But then the second thing Carpenter did was even more profound in its own way. So Carpenter's trying to make sense of the research literature. What does he know? Drugs are effective over the short term, right? Once you're on the drug, you come off really high relapse rates. Yet in these three studies, there was actually higher relapse associated with continuing medication use. So what's going on? And he said this, we know that once placed on medication, people are less vulnerable to relapse if maintained on the drugs. But what if they had never been placed on the drugs to begin with? We raise the possibility that these medications cause some change in the brain that makes people more biologically vulnerable to psychosis than they otherwise would be in the normal course of the illness. Now, do you see why this is so profound and unsettling? He's not talking about adverse, you know, all drugs have benefits and risks, right? He's not talking about the risks. He's worried that the drugs may cause a change that actually increases your risk of be having psychotic symptoms on the benefit side of the equation. Next, um, now this is a part of the research that really gets lost, and you can see why in a second, but it's very much coming back to the research literature now today. Two researchers from McGill Universities put together a biological explanation for what they thought was happening. And it goes like this. Antipsychotics work by blocking a, a chemical messenger in the brain, dopamine, right? And it's, they act like a, as a break on dopamine transmission. Okay, they thwart dopamine uh, transmission. So the brain, being this extraordinarily neuroplastic uh, organ, tries to compensate for the uh, presence of the drug, and it does so by putting down the accelerator. And literally what happens is, uh, well, neurons communicate in the brain this way. You have a presynaptic neuron that will release that chemical messenger into a tiny gap, which we call the synaptic cleft, and then that molecule binds with receptors on the receiving neuron, which we call the postsynaptic neuron. What antipsychotics do is they block those dopamine receptors, okay? So what does the brain do to compensate? The presynaptic neurons put out more dopamine than normal for a period of time. Then that adaptation actually burns out. And then the receiving neurons increase the density of receptors for dopamine. Okay, they upregulate. So what they found is that once you go on an antipsychotic, your number of receptors is about 50% greater than normal. And they said, now the brain is super sensitive to dopamine, and that has two consequences. One, when you come off, you're going to have severe relapses. And think about it this way. The drug acts as a, an a brake. Your brain puts down the accelerator. Now take away the brake. What do you got? So this is why we're getting these severe relapses. But they also worried that maybe, even if you stayed on the medication, the fact that super sensitivity would lead to more chronic severe, uh, symptoms over the long term, and symptoms would become, in fact, more severe. So that worry arises in the early 1980s, and then it gets dismissed. We're not going to worry about this anymore. And you can see why it gets dismissed, because it's so threatening to everything we're doing as a society, and frankly, to psychiatric beliefs. So it gets dismissed. That's 30 years ago. So now we have to ask ourselves, should we still be worried about this or not? And we'll see what research we have that can sort of um, bear on this question. Okay, so, and we're just gonna go around the research literature and find whatever we can. First, World Health Organization studies that compared outcomes 
in three developing countries, uh, India, Colombia, and Nigeria, versus outcomes in the US and five other developed countries. The first one was five years uh, long, and they found that outcomes were much, much better in the poor countries, specifically India and Nigeria. And by the way, it was this study that made me want to write about mental health. Because when I was doing that series for the Boston Globe, about abuses of psychiatric patients in research settings, I had completely conventional understandings. I thought we were discovering the cause of, of, of mental disorders. I thought these drugs fix chemical imbalances in the brain, this great progress. And then I found this study. And listen to what the World Health Organization investigators concluded. Living in a developed country is, quote, a strong predictor you won't have a good outcome. And I wondered, why would living in the richest countries of the world, with all their modern medicine, be a predictor you won't have a good outcome? So the WHO investigators ran another study, the WHO meaning World Health Organization. And in the second study, they hypothesized maybe the reason for the better outcomes in India and in Nigeria in particular, and Colombia, was that the, medic the patients were more medication compliant. They took their drugs more regularly. Now that's a valid hypothesis. If the medications are supposed to be essential, compliance should be associated with better outcomes, right? So they measured a, a medication usage and they found that in India and um, Nigeria, they used the medications quite differently. They used them acutely, but not long term. Only 16% of patients were regularly maintained on drugs long term. So at least in that cross-cultural study, you see better outcomes where they're using the drugs differently. And by the way, they went back 15 years later and they found in the poor countries dramatically better outcomes, especially socialization. Something like 53% were no longer symptomatic and 73% were working. Anyway, just one data point. <coughs> Now, let me skip to a couple of the more the key data points. In 1970s and, and, and late, late 1970s, late early 1980s, a researcher at the University of Illinois named Martin Harrell uh, launched the first, I mean, the best long-term perspective study of schizophrenia outcomes we've ever had. And here's how the study was designed. He goes to two Chicago area hospitals. And he enrolls one, one public, one private. He wants to get a class myth, mix, an ethnic mix. He enrolls 200 patients, psychotic patients. And everybody is treated conventionally in the hospital with medications, OK? And then they're discharged. And now he's just going to follow them at two, four and a half, seven and a half, 10, 15, and 20 years. And in each follow-up, he's going to see, are they symptomatic? Are they taking their medications? And are they anxious? How's their cognitive functioning, working, that sort of thing in school? At the end of 15 years, he still had 145 of the 200 patients in his study, which is ex extraordinary. In other words, he kept 77% of his patients in the study for 15 years. And here are some of his findings. Of the 145, 64 had a diagnosis of schizophrenia. And let's look at anxiety symptoms. At the end of two years, roughly 25 of the 64 had taken themselves off antipsychotics, and anxiety levels were high in both groups, both those on medications and those off. But then he found something really remarkable. In the off medication group between year two and four and a half, you see a lot of healing. You see anxiety go down, you see psychotic symptoms go down, and you see recovery rates go up. Such that, um, and by the way, the relapse studies don't show us that. It's only in this long-term study we see this longer-term course of healing. So if you compare and it's 64 medicated patients, 64 schizophrenia patients, beginning at year 4.5, they were less anxious, had much lower psychotic symptoms. They were much more or less likely to be psychotic. They had better cognitive function, and they were much more likely to be in recovery. And to be in recovery, you had to be, you couldn't have been hospitalized. You had a robust definition. You had to be asymptomatic. You had to be working or in school at least 50% of the time, and you had to have a, a decent social life. At the end of four and a half years, 40% of the off-med group were in recovery versus roughly 5% of the on-medication group. So an eight-fold higher recovery rate. It follows that way throughout all 15 years. <clears throat> 
So, and by the way, in, in every domain you look at, it's the off-medication group that's doing better. So there were fewer people chronically ill. The group with milder disorders had much higher recovery rates. And most dramatic of all, he ended up with four outcomes. He ends up with milder disorders on and off, schizophrenia on and off. And the outcomes stack up like this. Milder off is best, then schizophrenia off was second best. Then it was milder on, and then schizophrenia on was the worst. So in 2008, Martin Harrell was speaking at the, this is when he published his 15-year results. He was speaking at the 2008 meeting of the American Psychiatric Association. And he brought these research results forward and he says, I conclude that schizophrenia patients off medication long term have significantly better global outcomes. Now that's the best prospective long term study we have. And you see the problem here. How many of you heard about this study? Heard about this finding? That's the problem. This information doesn't become part of the discussion we need to have to produce better outcomes. Now, real quickly, the, the uh, criticism of the Harrow study was this. It's not randomized. It's just those with a better prognosis who got off and did better. Okay, it's, unfortunately, it's more complicated than that because, of course, those with milder disorders who stayed on did worse than schizophrenia off, and the milder disorders on, uh, milder disorders had a w better initial prognosis. But now we have a randomized study. It's done by Lex Wunderich in the Netherlands, and it was designed like this. People got, were stabilized on antipsychotic medications, and, and it was a fairly young group, age 25 or something. And then they're randomized either to a drug tapering, a drug discontinuation arm, or treatment as usual. And what did he report? A couple findings. At the end of two years, the group randomized to the drug discontinuation or low dose arm had higher relapse rates. They were more likely to have a return of psychotic symptoms. But functional outcomes were the same, and they actually were able to manage a lot of those, quote, return of psychotic symptoms without putting people back on medication. But at the end of seven years, the low-dose, no-dose group had lower relapse rates. It wasn't that much different than the medicated group. And over twice as high a recovery rate. So 40% were recovered versus 18% uh, in the on-medication group. So what did Lex Wunderich conclude? He said this. One, we've been looking at the wrong things. We've been looking at just symptom control over the short term. And what we need to be looking at is how medications affect people's lives over the long term. And he says, that may be a very different picture. And we need to refocus our research on these long-term outcomes. And then the second thing he says, you know, maybe when used as a one-size-fits-all, they lower recovery rates. They actually impair recovery rates especially when we come to employment. Oh, and one last thing going back to the Harrow study. Of the group that was off, now this study, if you go back to the, when, when they, with their hypothesis, the hypothesis was, we're gonna find out what happens to people who go off their medication, and our expectation is they're gonna do terrible. We're gonna find them homeless, et cetera, jail, et cetera. The expectation was a really bad outcome. So they were surprised. Of the people who got off by year two, and stayed off, 87% had two or more periods of sustained employment. He found people, one person became a lawyer, one person, be, a couple of people became teachers. And what he found was this, those diagnosed with schizophrenia who were able to get off, they disappeared from the system. Psychiatrists no longer saw them and they also stopped identifying as quote, having had schizophrenia. So the person who became a lawyer, do you think they tell people, I had a diagnosis of schizophrenia? They don't. And he, he says, we've lost the sight of robust recovery that happens out of the clinical picture. Among those who are medication compliant, only 17% had even one period of sustained employment. So there was this huge difference in employment. Another recent study, it was out of Australia. And the idea with this study, again, was a medication compliance study. We're going to take er people early in the course of their, their disorder. And, we're going to, and we think that the problem is so many patients stop taking their medications. 
So we're going to have, we're going to randomize, we're going to have people on medication. And one group is going to get extra care to make sure they keep on their medication. The other gets standard of care. What happened here? A, it worked. The group that got the extra care was more medication compliant. Unfortunately, they had worse outcomes. The medication compliant group. They had worse functional outcomes, greater negative symptoms. So what the Australian researchers said is, we may need to rethink this. So where are we at today? When I put this story together, a lot of this story, some of this data is brand new, the Wondering study, the Australian study. It was seen as heresy to suggest that not all people needed to be on antipsychotic medications all their lives. After this recent research, you have Martin Harrell now publishing in the Schizophrenia Bulletin, and he's going back to the dopamine supersensitivity worry. Is it possible, he says, that as the brain adapts to the drug, that drugs that are effective over the short term, could they impair recovery over the long term? That just appeared in Schizophrenia Bulletin. There was a recent editorial in British Journal of Psychiatry, hardly some sort of uh, bastion of heresy. And they looked at this and they said, we have to rethink our use of antipsychotics. There is just compelling evidence that if we're interested in long-term functional outcomes, we really need to think about for whom and for how long. There was an editor, editorial now in the archives of general psychiatry that said the same thing. They said some people on that first episode of psychosis, if we treat them carefully, provide a safe place, we can get them through and they'll never need to go on the medications. And there's a second group that maybe we can taper down either to a low dose or, or get them off entirely. So what you see in these editorials is a call for a selective use model to replace the one size fits all. And in the selective use model, it's really along around these ideas. For whom and for how long? And at what dosages? It's a very different question. And finally, Thomas Insel, the director of the NIMH, recently wrote a blog saying this very thing. So again, this is not heresy. He looked at Wondering. He worked at Harrow and he says, is it possible these medications are lowering recovery rates on the whole over the long term? And do we need to rethink them? And again, I hope you see in this story, it's not that the medications are bad. It's, it's what is the natural capacity to recover in different groups? How do you maximize this for different people? And if you really look in the data, it's telling you this. You would build, I think, an, uh, a, a protocol around two principles. At that very first episode, you try to see if you could get people through it, restore sleep-wake benzos without putting them on antipsychotics because there'd be some significant percentage that in fact would recover from the psychotic episode and in essence they would just have an episode of illness. And if people weren't getting better after three, four weeks, then you'd put them on the medications, have them help, and then you'd have another moment when you divided your protocol, you figured out who needed to be on the medications long term and who can go off. Now the brilliance about this story of science is that 20 years ago, 22 years ago, a group in Finland adapted a medical pro uh, drug use protocol exactly along those lines. They're in northern Finland. They, they have used a form of care called open dialogue therapy. And they now have, by far, the best reported long-term outcomes for psychotic disorders in the Western world. So what it talks, this is what I meant when I began saying this is actually a story, one of the themes here is of hope. It's talking about better use and where can it lead. So what do they do? I'll spend the next five minutes on this. What do they do in northern Finland? They have a form of care called open dialogue therapy. And they get people help right away, okay? They try to get involved the moment symptoms start, start appearing. Now they do conceive of psychosis differently than we do here in the United States. They do not say that psychosis resides in the head of the person. What they say is psychosis resides in the in-between spaces of people. And therefore you need, and, and the person who is psychotic bears the burden of making known this disruption in social spaces. So the idea is you have to treat a larger social web. Anyway, they throw a lot of, of care up front. There is this idea that goes like this. Human beings form narratives in your mind. And one of the things that happens with, with psychotic, people who are having psychotic breaks, 
They, they lose a narrative that allows them to sort of thrive or be in society in some sort of good fashion. So what you need to do is rebuild the internal narrative. And so one of the things they focus on is not illness at all, but trying to get the person to remember all the things they did well in the past. Then they try to create social situations where people are doing well in the present. And then they try to encourage people to have narratives going forward of becoming something, becoming whatever, engineer, whatever it might be. Here's their five-year results. And they've done two such five-year studies. 80% of their first episode psychotic patients are asymptomatic by five years. 80% are working or back in school. Only 20% have gone on to long-term disability. In terms of medication usage, it goes like this. 67% of their first episode patients at, after five years have not been exposed to antipsychotics. They have been placed on benzodiazepines to restore sleep weight, but 67% have not been exposed to antipsychotics. There's another 13% that use them temporarily, and 20% maintained on them regularly. Now, I went to this area of Finland, northern Finland, and if you said they were anti-medication, they'd say, what are you talking about? Not anti-medication. We think they're very helpful. But we found a way to use them. And one of the things that's most remarkable of all, you know that 80% that's working or back in school, back in the employment? Their unemployment of that 80% is lower than it is for the Finnish population as a whole. Now why? Because as part of their recovery process is they bring in employers, they bring these bridges back into a, a robust sort of uh, way of living. Final bit here. Again, I hope you see this as a story of hope, of really robust recovery that is possible that maybe we can remember because what has happened in the United States is we actually reconceived of mental disorders along a chronic, uh, a chronic conception. You have it and you can recover in the sense you can manage your symptoms. What you can really see in nature time and time again is often these were episodic problems. People had an episodic dis problem of, of mania, an episodic episode of depression, episodic disorders of, of psychosis, and we have forgotten that. And what this story is telling us is there's a possibility to recapture that sense of episodic problems. Now, some people always turn chronic, but turn a lot of these disorders back into episodic problems. By the way, and then I'll, I'll close up here. In Finland, in this area of Finland, it's a population of 70,000. Before they adopted this, moder this mode of care, they were having 27 new cases of schizophrenia a year. And if you do the numbers, that's a lot of new cases for a population that size. They're now down to two or three cases of schizophrenia. A 90% drop. But you know what? The eruption of first psychotic episodes has not decreased in that society. So what's going on? To get a diagnosis of schizophrenia under the DSM, you have to have symptoms for six months or more, right? What they're doing is they're getting so good at breaking that psychotic episode, of terminating it, that people aren't moving from that first episode to a diagnosis of schizophrenia. And if you go there, they'll say it has completely changed our understanding of what is possible. Final thing. So I wrote this book, Anatomy of an Epidemic. It came out and people started looking at this program, Open Dialogue Therapy, and a foundation formed. I actually helped form, uh, form this foundation. It's called the Foundation for Excellence in Mental Health Care. They've been raising funds to basically do research on long-term outcomes. And one of the research they're now funding is two uh, open dialogue replication projects in Massachusetts. And the, th the thing here is this. Four years ago, if they had proposed this in a medical environment, the institutional review boards would have said, you can't do this, because you have to medicate right away, right? It's, it's unethical to not put people on antipsychotics right away. But what these two groups have done, and they're, they're academic-based, is they brought this literature forward and shows that there is an evidence-based rationale for this sort of selective um, use model. And now the IRBs are going, okay, there is. And so this is a story, I think, of how science and a free discussion of science and the history of science can actually lead us to a better place.
And the better place, ultimately, I think, is this possibility. We will rediscover that so often, if you go back to that first episode, that first problem, if we do right in helping people get through that first problem, often it will become episodic. And it won't turn down this chronic path that we see so often today and is, in fact, of course, fueling the disability. So, final thing, please do not take this as anything about medical advice. It's not meant to be for an individual. It's just meant to see how do we, A, as a society, think about how we can do best by people who struggle with psychiatric problems, and B is this. How can our society have a fully informed discussion about this science without being defensive about it so we can really think about what is best for all the people we love. So thank you.